Hello everyone and welcome to the table. My name's Tim and today we're at the table to learn Twilight Imperium 4th edition. This is a, I mean it's described as a epic board game of conquest, politics, and trade. One of the most straightforward analogs to it would be like a 4x strategy game or a, a, it's considered a space opera. 3 to 6 Eight, if you have the expansion, which I do have, but I'm not going to talk about this quite yet. I'll save that for another video. So if you see some components you don't recognize, it's just because I've got everything piled into the one box. Don't worry too much about it. But three to six players are going to be playing a faction in the political struggles to control a region of space after the fall of the Lazax Empire. This game is huge. If you've heard anything about it, that's probably one of the main things that you've heard. And yes, it does take as long as you've probably heard, I think, my longest game of 3rd edition, which is a bit slower to play than 4th edition is, but I think my longest game was somewhere along the lines of 16 hours. We started it on Friday night and actually finished it on Sunday morning. Most won't be like that, especially if people know what they're doing. So hopefully at the end of this video, you'll have a better idea of how to play this and you'll have a better idea of whether this game is for you. I hope it is. It is a great game, but let's get started. Now, what we're going to start with is just some of the initial setup first before we get too deep into all of the components and how to actually play. Now, the first thing we got to start with is your map. Now, Twilight Imperium is a board game with a map built of these large hexagon tiles. It's built in concentric rings, which you may or may not be able to see. I do have the play mat courtesy of one of my one of my friends that I usually play this game with. Thanks, Aaron. Um, the map is built in concentric rings from the center Mechatol Rex, the seat of the Galactic Society, I guess you can think of it that way. Now, the important thing to note, though, is that unlike some other games, the map is going to be built before you start playing. There are kind of two main ways of doing that. The first is a mini-game where everyone is given a hand of of tiles and you build the map out before you start playing. I honestly don't recommend doing this, especially with new players. Not everyone's going to know the value of every tile, and as long as this game is, if you get a bad start because of the map setup, it's going to set you feeling bad for hours. <laughs> Alternatively, and this is what I always do, is I will use a pre-generated map. The rulebook has a few, although if you play with odd-numbered groups, so 5, 3, 7 with the expansion, uh, the maps tend to look a little strange. They work better for even-numbered groups so that you can have everyone set up along the table, split up evenly. What I actually usually use with those groups, and sometimes with, with even number groups as well, is a, well, you can look up something, uh, TI4 Balanced Map Generator. That's the kind of thing that I normally use. You can look online and find these. Basically, it's a system that will generate a balanced map for you based off of how many players that you've got with some uh, optional rule additions uh, for the factions that you might have in play. And what you'll end up with that is an asymmetrical map. So with even numbers, you'll everyone start on the periphery. With odd numbers, uh, you might have some people start closer to the middle or at weird positions relative to each other. But it's designed to be fair, kind of regardless of where you are. And I do really like that one. That's always a good place to start. If you're the one that's hosting, 
build the map before your players show up. That is one of the things that can take a little bit. All of the tiles are numbered, but you may not even be able to see this. Uh, probably not. There's a little number there on the little edge of the tile there. Finding all the tiles you need to build out these maps is slow. So do that ahead of time. Now, next, you're going to have many, 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 many components. You're going to have a bag all my stuff because it's so much more convenient but you're gonna have a bag of plastic ships uh, for each of the colors uh, along with that you're going to have two decks of cards associated with those colors uh, one deck of cards as a back that looks like that you can see this is for yellow the other deck I say deck it's only a handful of cards but there's a more neutral back but on the front of it they are color-coded as well um, you're going to need to combine those together. Along with that, there is a little player aid and pool sheet. Don't worry about it. That is color-coded as well. So you'll need to find and match all the things that are color-coded. The next thing you'll need to do is figure out what factions everyone else is going to play. Now, for factions, you start with a few different things. The first thing is a home system. You can see there's a little symbol in the corner there that tells you what faction this home system is for. You're also going to have some more components specific to that faction. Some cardboard control markers with their faction symbol. Some double-sided command counters. One side is a ship, the other side is the faction symbol. And you're going to have some cards. Again, I have expansion stuff, don't worry too much about it, but you're going to have all the planet cards for their home system. These are double-sided. One side's gray, one side's colored. You're going to have some other unique cards. You'll have some faction tech. You'll have a faction promissory note. We'll get into that. And then because I have the expansion, I've got um, agents and a mech unit, but don't worry too much about that. Just collect everything for the factions, figure out how you want to do it. Um, I usually will hand out a couple factions to each player and give them a choice of um, what ones they want to play, but however you handle it, figure out who's going to play what. Uh, there is one other thing that you need that is not on my table yet, and that is this. This is your faction sheet. Um, it's used for a few things. This is all your unit information. You've got special abilities here. But you also have on the back a whole block of text that is flavor text. There's also a, an entire book called The Lore Compendium that is devoted just to the lore of this game. Um, with some information about the planets and their home system and population. None of that really matters for gameplay, though. What does matter is this spot on the bottom here that tells you starting components. We'll get to that later, but know where it is. Figure out who's going to play what, and then randomly assign someone at the table the speaker token. This is one of the most important pieces in the game, and it will be trading hands set it randomly to start with. You're going to have a bunch of decks of cards that you need to deal with. You'll have a stack of planet cards, one for every planet on your map. Don't shuffle these. You'll want to be able to dig through them to find the ones you're looking for. Fortunately, in 4th edition, they're double-sided to make it a bit easier to find. Set that aside, but make sure you know where it is. You're going to have two very big decks of cards, one blue and one yellow and red. These are agenda cards. These are action cards. Shuffle them both up. Um, then you got these. Find your point track. It is double-sided. One side's 10, one side's 14. 14 is the long game variant, or the long war. Sorry. Um... Don't use that to start with, especially early on, because the number of objectives doesn't change. It just means you need to score more of them. So stick with 10. Set that somewhere. And everyone is going to take one of their little 
kind of rectangular command counters, sorry, com control markers, and put them on zero. This is your track for score. And then you got these. These are the objectives. There's three different types of objectives. You've got secret objectives, phase two, and phase one objectives. Shuffle them all up. Everyone gets dealt a secret objective at the start. Obviously, this is secret. Um, but then for the phase one and phase two, what you're going to do is you're going to make an objective deck. Very simple. Just after you shuffle them up, deal five phase two objectives. And then on top of them, deal five phase ones. This is your objective deck. Do not shuffle it. The order is important. The game kind of has a flow to it. You'll start with phase one objectives, which tend to be easier to pull off. And then as the game goes on, you'll get into the phase two objectives, which are harder, but are worth more points. Um, this is also your timer for the game. The game does end. <laughs> It does have a timer. It doesn't just end when someone gets to 10 victory points. It also ends if you have to reveal a new objective card and there are none left in your stack. So you look at this, you think, okay, 10 objectives, 10 rounds? Well, not quite. You're going to reveal a couple of them at the start of the game um, so that everyone has an idea of what you're going to be shooting for. The rules say to reveal the first two objective cards. So, near wherever you have your point track off the side, you're going to flip over the first two phase one objectives. These are public objectives. Everyone gets access to scoring them. Um, so, set them somewhere that everyone can read. I can't get into too much else without explaining the rest of the game. So, I'm going to change the camera view so you can have a better view of what I've got going on on the table here. So I will be back in a moment. All right, so welcome back. We're going to get into some of the finish off some of the setup information first before we get into the anatomy of the components and how to actually play the game. So one quick thing, you're going to take your reference here that's got some uh, quick reference information if you need some quick reminders about what you know some of the parts of the game are you're gonna slide that under your faction sheet here what you're then going to do is you're going to take obviously the components for your faction set them aside you're gonna take the planet cards for your factions home system and set them face up somewhere in your play space um, you're going to, like I said, take one of your control markers, put it on zero. You're going to take your secret objective and put it somewhere that you can get at. Set your racial tech somewhere you can reach and read. Set your faction-specific promissory note aside. Take the rest of the components. I'm going to use yellow for the Emirates have a con, which actually, if we give a thing there, Space Lions, yes, it's a thing. It's been a thing since the start of Twilight Imperium. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, these guys are kind of the um, trade princes of the region, I guess. You can think of it that, that, was that way. We're going to use yellow for them. You're going to take the, the bag of components and set that in your play space. You're going to take your cards that I talked about here. This stack here are technologies. Set them aside. This stack here are promissory notes. Add your faction specific one, the one that has your faction symbol on the bottom corner there, and add that to the stack there. Keep that somewhere in arm's reach. Next, you're going to take command, command counters. You're going to start with three in your tactics pool, this top one here. You're going to start with two in your strategy pool, this bottom one here. And you're going to start with three in your fleet supply. Now, you're going to flip the fleet supply tokens over to show the ship symbol, just to distinguish between the two different types. 
Uh, and you're going to set that up as well. That is your initial arrangement. Uh, you're also going to take your starting commodities. Commodities are resources that your faction just kind of makes. So for the space lines of the Emirates of Akan, I don't know, hairballs? Doesn't matter. You're going to take your starting commodities. Now, you got a bag here of tokens. I have a bag of tokens. These double-sided tokens. You've got one and three. These do flip over. Now... This side are trade goods, a kind of universal currency. You can see there's a spot on your sheet there for trade goods. This side are commodities. Commodities are no good to your faction, but are, are useful as trade goods to other factions. We'll get to how that works in a moment. So, the Emirates of Akan start with six commodities. Two stacks of three there. Next, you're going to need to take your faction's home system. The one that has the symbol there. You've got the three cards in this case corresponding to the three planets. Most systems don't have three planets. Most will be either one or two. You'll also need to, slide these aside for now, look at the back of your sheet here for your starting components. There are starting technologies and starting units. Now, starting technologies, we're going to go into your technology deck here it's a whole stack of them technologies are split into two main types you have your kind of generic upgrades and then you have unit upgrades generic upgrades are colored if we look here the text is a color in this case red it also has a colored symbol in the bottom there so this is a red technology this one green blue yellow four different colors Four different shaped symbols as well for any of you that might have problems distinguishing these colors. The unit upgrades don't have colors. And what these actually do when you research them, so if we look here, I got carriers mark two, they actually cover up the spot on your sheet for your units. And that is a permanent upgrade for the rest of the game. We'll get to how those work in a moment. Now, as the Emirates of Akan, I start with Anti-Mass Deflectors, which is a blue technology. So I'm going to dig through my stack here and try and find Anti-Mass Deflectors. I'm going to set that face up somewhere in my play area, showing that I have it. I also start with Sarween Tools, which is a yellow technology. Boom. Same thing. The rest of these get set aside. Don't need them for now. Now, starting units, it says I start with two carriers, one cruiser, two fighters, four infantry, and one space dock. So, we go into this bag, and we fish out some of the units. Now, we're going to set them aside for now. They will start on your home system. Um, space docks... Let me get one of... Actually, let's just explain all of the units in their entirety. Flip that back over here. Starting with... Bring that more into view. Space docks. Here is a space dock. Space docks are a bit unique for a number of reasons. These are your production buildings. These are where you actually build units out of. But these also have to be assigned to... A planet. They're not just assigned to a system, they're assigned to a planet in that system. Keep that in mind. You can have multiple space docks in the same system. However, what is important to note is you only have a limited number of them. And for the cases of the majority of your units, your plastic pieces are what you're going to be limited by. So that's that. Then we look here. Next is infantry. Infantry are this little flag here. You're going to hear me refer to them as ground forces all the time, but because that's what they were called in 3rd edition. So infantry, ground forces, same thing. Um, these either have to be stashed on a planet, or they can be carried along uh, on a unit that has capacity for them. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Next, the smallest ships, fighters. 
exactly what they sound like. These are not capital ships, whereas all of the other ships are capital ships. And these cannot support themselves. They need to be carried as well, similar to infantry. Um, before we get into the rest of the ships, we're going to talk very briefly about PDS, Planetary Defense Systems. Basically a giant cannon that points up at space and can fire off at ships that are trying to invade or whatever the case may be. Space docks and PDS units are unique in that they can only be built in one specific way. We'll get to that later. All of the other units can be produced in your space docks or other units that have production that has faction abilities kick in. The thing to note here is you have a bunch of rules here that are unique to your faction and for the most part let you break some of the rules of the game. Um, so there's every faction is going to have a unique set of starting units, a unique set of starting tech, their home systems are unique, their faction abilities are unique, they have unique racial technologies that they can upgrade, they have a unique flagship that they can build. So there's a lot of asymmetry here in how the different factions play. Moving on though, the next unit is the carrier. Carriers have capacity. Carriers have a lot of capacity. They've got four to start with. So that means one carrier can support any combination of four fighters and ground forces. They would move with the carrier. Carriers are also really, really bad at combat, though, so you'll need to protect them. What kind of things might you protect them with? Well, you could protect them with a destroyer. Destroyers are really good anti-fighter ships. They're also pretty cheap. Um you know, decent kind of unit, especially if your opponents are massing fighters, your destroyers have a anti-fighter barrage that you can use to whittle down the fighter shield. You might also use cruisers. Cruisers are just a solid kind of mid-level ship. They got a few different ways they can be upgraded. They can actually be upgraded to have capacity. They're just a decent ship for their cost. If you want something bigger, though, you go Dreadnoughts. Dreadnoughts are big, slow, lumbering ships that have a little bit of capacity, but can actually bombard planets and potentially wipe out uh, infantry before the fight starts, essentially nuking them from orbit. Now, every uh, color has a flagship... If I can find it here, that's a dreadnought. Where is the yellow flagship? <laughs> there it is. There's your flagship. Um, every color has a flagship. Every faction has a unique flagship. Make sure you read this. Um, now, flagships are unique in that they can only be built in your home system, and you only have one of them. But they are, overall, extremely powerful. And then there's these. You get two of them that you have the op opportunity to build through the course of the game. These are War Suns. Now, to distinguish them from Death Stars, they've made them very pointy. <laughs> um, they're also described in the game as like black hole generators that they eat planets. Very interesting, very threatening. They're actually really unique for a number of reasons. To start with, you can't build them from the start of the game. If you want to build them, you actually need to first research the corresponding technology card. Because if you look here, the numbers here, so this sheet is useful because it, it, it breaks down the costs, the combat value, the movement and the capacity of all of your ships, as well as any extra abilities here. Um, the numbers here are all blank. I need to first research the War Sun technology, which sockets it here, and then that gives me values for everything. They cost 12, which is the most expensive ship in the game, but they are incredibly powerful. Incredibly powerful. Um, P 
PDS units, for instance, have a, an ability called Planetary Shield that protects them from bombardments. But with War Suns, there's a rule here, other players' units with Planetary Shield lose that ability. So if you have a War Sun in play, you can bombard a planet that's protected anyway. They are very threatening, but they're also very expensive and not easy to get. Um, as cool as they are, you don't want to actually go for them with every faction because of the starting technologies that you get and the racial uh, uh, technologies. It may actually not be worth it for every single faction to go for War Suns because their upgrade path is very specific. But this is our initial setup here. This stuff is all going to be off away from the map. You're going to take your starting units and you're going to plop them in your home system. You'll have a space dock. You'll pick a planet to put it on. And you'll have units in the system as well. And then, once everyone's done their initial setup, you can start playing. The game is split into four phases, but the fourth phase won't trigger at the start of the game. We'll get to that one later. Um, but the four phases as such are the strategy phase, the action phase, the status phase, and the agenda phase. The agenda phase doesn't happen right away. What is the strategy phase? Well, somewhere in your components, you're going to have this stack of eight colorful strategy cards. Each one of them has a number on the back, one to eight. See? And in the status, sorry, in the strategy phase, in speaker order, you're going to hear that term a lot. Speaker order basically refers to clockwise from the speaker or counterclockwise, however you want to handle it, just in order from the speaker. We usually do clockwise. Um, so, again, this token is very important because it lets you pick strategy cards first. Now, big number on the back, that is used in the action phase. We'll get to that. But you can see there's eight of them. How many of these are going to be in play is based off of your player counts. If Let's say you have six players. Let's say you have the full contingent of six players. There's eight cards, so two of them aren't going to be picked. So what you're going to do is you're going to set those aside somewhere. And you're going to take a trade good from the bag and put them on... Oh, you can't see them. See, I zoomed... I, I did the camera so that you could see some of the components more closely, but it's really limiting how much of my, my table I can actually use. Um, you're going to take the, the strategy cards that weren't picked, you're going to put a trade good on each of them. And what that means is every round those strategy cards don't get picked. You get more and more trade goods added onto them. But as soon as someone takes it, they also take the trade goods that are on them and immediately put them in their trade good pool. Basically, there's, there, there's an incentive to take a strategy card that hasn't been taken in a few turns because you just get a bit of extra cash. Trade goods, like I said, are, are a kind of universal currency. The strategy phase is very simple. You draft the strategy cards. Actually, I guess I should explain that. What you're going to do is the speaker is going to take this entire stack of strategy cards. They're going to pick one. Set that next to them. Somewhere in their play space. And they're going to pass the rest to the next person. It's going to go until everyone has one of these. With six players, like I said, there are going to be two that aren't picked. With... Five players, you're going to have three that aren't picked. With three players and four players, things get a little weird. Um, how it's going to work is it's actually going to go around twice. With four players, the speaker's going to pick, it goes around, and then eventually it comes back to the speaker with four tiles or four strategy cards remaining. They'll pick another one, it goes back around. So with four players, you actually use all eight of the strategy cards. Uh, with three, you do the same thing, but you end up with one left over. And in those cases, everyone has two. Now, 
In the action phase, these big numbers on the back determine turn order. Speaker doesn't determine turn order in the action phase. It's these strategy cards with the, the lowest initiative value going first. So in the case of three or four players, you're going to look at your two strategy cards. Let's say we had that one and that one. There's your turn order there is based off of the lowest one. Okay. Now, we'll get to what else these are used for in a minute, but let's explain the action phase. The action phase is where the majority of the game is. If we pull up this sliding rules reference here of this quick summary here, this entire chunk of it is the action phase. This just explains some of the planets, which we'll get to in a second. This explains the status phase, but this entire chunk is the action phase, and this is one action, specifically the tactical action. There are three types of actions you can do on a turn during the action phase. How it's going to work is in initiative order, you're going to go around and do actions. You do a thing, play moves on. Until you have either done enough actions and you don't want to do any more, or you cannot do any more actions. At which point, you pass. There is a limitation. Before you can pass, you have to do your strategic action, but we'll get to that in a minute. So, first, let's break down some of the actions. But before we do that, so that you have a better understanding of things, let's look at one of these planet tiles. So, this one is not a home system. This is a this is a, a regular system planet tile. It has two planets on it, and there's a ton of iconography here. And we are going to need to understand that before we can really move forward so that you understand the value of the different planets that you're fighting for. So you have the names of the planets here, the the little box is colored, and there's a big symbol there and there. Those aren't really gameplay relevant uh, at the moment. Uh, there are some things that reference them that basically references what type of planet it is. Red systems are uh, hazardous planets. Green are industrial. Blue are cultural. And such. Um, some things might reference them. For the most part, you don't need to worry about them. Other stuff that's really important are these two numbers here. There's a number in yellow and a number in blue. The number in yellow there is the resource value of the planet, basically how rich the planet is in uh, mineral and material resources. The blue is the influence of the planet, basically is exactly how influential the planet is. If we look here at the big Mechatol Rex in the middle there, you can see its resource value is one, but its influence is six. The big galactic center of the of the of the galactic society and council there is so influential and so powerful for the person that controls it um so keep that kind of thing in mind there's also one thing kind of special about this one you can see a little symbol there a little symbol right there and if we look at one of the starting tech that i've got here you can see it matches the yellow starting tech color and what that means is that that planet has a technology specialty, in this case a yellow technology specialty. Um, that will come up later when we explain how to research technologies, how you, how you actually go through this massive deck of research technology cards. But that is something very important to look for, so keep that in mind. Okay, now let us break down the tactical action. The tactical action is the main action that people are going to do. Let's just take our home system. Let's take that system that I just showed here. We'll build just a basic three tile map here just so that I can explain some parts of this game. And let's say we had some ships in the system. What actually does the Emirates of Akan start with. Let's see. They start with two carriers. They start with one cruiser. They start with four infantry. Doop, doop, doop. 
they start with one space dock, and they start with two fighters. So that is their starting fleet. You're going to take that fleet, and you're going to put it on the planet. Pick a planet for the space dock. Uh, I'll explain it in a minute, but overall, you want to put the planet, or you want to put the space dock on the planets with the highest resource value. So in this case, that would be our Ritz right here as it has a resource value of two and this one has a one this one has a zero so most beneficial there and then that is the only thing that has to be assigned to a planet because we have carriers in the system that have capacity of four if we look at the sheet there so that means they can support four each ground forces and fighters i got four ground forces or infantry and two fighters so that's six total so i'm good on capacity limits space docks also have capacity they can support fighters specifically in this case they can support up to three fighters without any other ships in the system so i don't need to assign my ground forces to any of the planets here if i don't want to because i have ships that can support them so that's my starting fleet there Bring this back here, put the commodities back on here, and let's talk about tactical actions. So, the tactical action is the main action that everyone's going to be doing. I said that already. What is the tactical action? If we slide that there, this is the tactical action. It has five main steps to it, but... It's basically a catch-all action for the majority of what you're going to want to do in the game. Do you want to build units? That's the tactical action. Do you want to move units? That's the tactical action. Do you want to fight someone? Tactical action. Do you want to take control of a planet? Tactical action. It's used for just about everything. How does it work? Well, the first stage of it is activation. Now, what does that mean? That's another term that you're going to hear a lot. you activating a system that you control or that you don't control or whatever the case may be. This is what it means. You're going to take one of your command tokens from your tactics pool, tactical action, tactics pool, and you're going to place it in the system that you want to do stuff in. In this case, I want this system. There's planets here. I want them. So I'm going to pop that on that tile. I have now activated that uh, system. The second part of the tactical action is movement. There is move ships and space cannon offense. We'll get to space cannon later when we discuss how combat works. Move ships. So I look at my ships that I've got here. I've got two carriers. I've got a cruiser. My carriers have a movement of one. My cruiser has a movement of two. So all three of these ships can get there. So I can move all of my ships into that system. And because... They're on the ships, the fighters and the ground forces go with them. Now, let's say we had the ground forces on the planet specifically. Well, as part of the movement, they can get beamed up onto the ships and brought along with. Um, I could, I could have activated a system two spaces away. I just have to be able to move ships into it. You can't move ships unless they can get to the system that was activated, but... My cruiser has a movement of two, so my cruiser could go bump, bump, and get into that system. But there's not that much value for it at the start, because I need planets. I need the resources that comes along with those. I need these planets. So, that is the second part of, uh, of the tactical action. The third part is space combat. We'll get to that later. There's no enemies in this system, so I don't have to fight anybody in space. The fourth part is invasion. So that's essentially your ground combat. How invasion works is, all right, I got two planets here. I need to assign how many ground forces, again, infantry. I, you're going to hear me use that a lot just because I played third edition so much and they're just called ground forces there. I need to assign how many infantry units I'm going to send at each of the planets in the system. In this case, I'll go two and two. In this specific case, it doesn't matter that much because there's no enemies there. If there were enemies, then this would trigger invasion combat and bombardment and space cannon defense and that whole thing. But we'll get to that later. There's no enemies there. So I take the planets. 
So I need to now go through this stack of cards to find the two planets that I am taking control of. I got Sakulag and Lazar. So give me a quick moment here to go through this stack. Hopefully this is the right one. I got a, there is a lot of cards. So there is Lazar. And there is Sakulag. Now, uh, as with many of the other parts of this game, there is a little bit of flavor text on each of these planet cards, giving you a brief overview of what that planet actually is or does, or you know what is relevant about it. Now, I've taken the system, right? I get the planets. Sure, but I get them exhausted. And what does that mean? That means you take the cards and you flip them over to the gray side, and you cannot use them yet. Um, any any planets you take over in a round come to you, but they come to you exhausted, which means you can't use them until they get refreshed. Exhausted is another term that you'll hear a lot that basically means you flip the card over, and whenever uh, an effect says ready exhausted cards or things like that, you get to flip them back, and then you can use them. So that was the fourth. I... I do invasion combat and establish control. I have established control. I control them now. Cool. They're mine. Awesome. I get the cards. The fifth part is production. I have no built. I have no units with production in that region, so I don't get to do it. But let's say I wanted to build ships. Now I've moved my entire fleet into this sector here, and now this one's empty, looking a little barren. I want to build some ships. So on a later turn, I might take another tactical action, but activate. This system, I don't move ships, I don't do space combat, I don't do invasion, but I can produce in that system. Awesome. How does production work? Well, if you look on the spot for space docks, you'll see a value called production X, where um, each space dock can produce a number of units up to a max. And what that maximum is is 2 plus the resource value of the planet. That's why I said you'd want to have your space dock on your highest value planet. However, I do also have Sarween Tools, which is a tech that I start with, which says when one, of your, when one or more of your units use production, reduce the combined cost of produced units by one. So while I'm producing, that's a thing I gotta keep in mind. How does production work? Well, the amount of physical pieces I can make is 2 plus the value of the system, the value of the planet that has the space dock on it. It has a production value of 2, which means I can make 4 physical units of any cost, as long as I can pay for them. Sarween Tools is going to reduce the total cost by 1, not of each unit, just by 1. So I'll pick all the units I want to build and reduce that total cost by 1. Um, I then look at how much money I have. I don't have any trade goods to start with, but I do have my planets here. I got a resource value of one here, zero here, two here. So that means I actually have three resources I can build stuff with. Technically four, because I get a free one from Sarween Tools. So I can build, say, if I spend one resource, I can build two fighters. Fighters and, and infantry work in that way. There's a little... Thing there it says one cost but shows two symbols of the unit so each one you pay for lets you produce two units so i can produce two fighters that's one resource i could produce a destroyer that seems good that's another resource and oh hmm i might need another carrier well that's three resources okay well i'll set the destroyer aside and get a carrier instead and then that's three units that's four resources i have to spend so one two, three, and then the bonus one from Sarween Tools, that's production, these go into that system. Awesome, I have more ships. Now, one rule I haven't mentioned yet is that ships cannot move out of a system that has one of your command counters in it, which means these guys that I moved earlier and these guys that I just built are stuck for the round. You will get to remove these command counters later, but for the rest of the round, I can't move them. They're stuck. And that kind of limits how much 
control of the board you can take in a single turn. Now, I produced in this system. This system has three planets, though. Later in the game, I might want to build a couple more space docks in that system. You might think, well, why would you want to do that? Well, when you produce, you get to activate, or you get to produce in all of your production units in that system. I got three production units now. And sure, this may have a resource value of zero, this may have a resource value of one, but it adds up. I've activated the system, not the planet. So if I have my three space docks on that system, I get a production value of, what is it, four here for this one, two for this one, three for this one. So I can produce nine units. That could be huge. That could be a lot of units. Now, all of the main components of the game are limited by plastic pieces. So there are no more than uh, uh, five dreadnoughts. There are one, two, three, I think it's five. <laughs> I always forget. Yeah, five. There are only five dreadnoughts. Once you have five dreadnoughts, you cannot have more than that. You can build more, which you might want to scuttle one of your existing dreadnoughts. All scuttling is, is it's, you're choosing to opt to destroy a unit, remove it from the board, put it back to your supply. However, infantry and fighters are not limited. You got these tokens here that are worth one or three, um that you can use to mark out if you're building tons of fighters you can use these to mark fighters there is one quirk about it though you cannot just have cardboard tokens you have to have at least one plastic piece with them okay keep that in mind everything else is limited by how many pieces you have you want more space stocks you already have three on the board too bad you'll have to move one <laughs> Uh, not much you can do about it. Sorry to say. But that is the tactical action in a nutshell. I, get, I said we'll get to combat later. Combat is a bit uh, a bit weird. We don't need to worry about it for now. But that right there, that series of actions right there, is what you're going to be spending the majority of your game doing. Now, what are the other two actions? Well, you have component actions and you have strategic actions. Actions. Component actions are, you might have a faction ability that says, as an action, do this. You might have a, an action card that says, as an action, do this. Anything like that is considered a component action. You have to do an action on your turn. Or you have to pass. Okay? But you can use component actions to delay things, because it is a war game. There is area control going on here. There are reasons why you might want to wait to do something. So component actions can be useful for that, or you might just want the, the ability that it gives you anyways. Oh, here's, an here's a perfect example. My Production Biomes Racial Technology card for the Emirates of Akan here says, in big bold letters, also italicized, Action. So as an action, I can do what's on this card as long as I have this card researched. Okay? Cool. Now, the other main action of the action phase is the strategic action. Now, you notice you got your three pools here. Tactics is used for the tactics action. Strategy, these are used for the strategic actions. Now, these strategy cards that you drafted in the strategy phase, before the action phase. These aren't just big, colorful tokens with a, a number here. There's actually a whole bunch of text on the back of all of them. And these represent something really, really interesting. Basically, where some war games see you waiting and waiting and waiting for other people to take their turns, each one of these represents a phase that one person claimed and trigger can trigger on their turn. Now, you have to do your strategy action before you can pass. You can't take a card and then never use it. You have to do it before you can pass. That's the one caveat of the action phase. And what are these? Um, if you look, they're all set up largely the same way. You have what it is at the top here. In this case, one is leadership. You have a primary ability and a secondary ability. The primary ability is whoever took the card and activates it, gets to use the primary ability. 
Everyone else can choose to use the secondary ability, and it is a choice because for the most part, to activate the secondary, it's going to say you'll need to spend a command counter from your strategy pool, which will just go back to your supply here. At the start of the game, you start with three here, three here, two here, so you can only really get involved with two other than the one that you took. The one that you took, you just do it for free. It's part of your, it's part of your action here, okay? Now, what do we have? Leadership. Leadership is a bit of a weird one. Leadership is your main way of getting more of these command counters back. You're going to get two back at the end of the action phase anyways. But leadership lets you get spend influence to get more of them. Um, and then whoever does it gets a nice little bonus here. The primary abilities are almost always better than the secondary abilities on top of, on top of, of not having to spend tokens, as the case may be. So leadership is pretty straightforward. Let's you do more stuff over the course of the game. Diplomacy, the, I'll explain the secondary first. The secondary lets you spend a token uh, from your strategy pool to ready two exhausted planets, up to two. Well, remember how I took those planets and I got them exhausted? I could use diplomacy to ready them. I can use them now. Cool, awesome, sweet. The primary is a bit weird. The primary lets you make essentially a demilitarized zone. You choose one system other than Mechatol Rex that contains a planet you control. Everyone else has to take a command token from their supply, so you're not taking away the resources from them. And they gotta put it in that system. Essentially, now like I said, units in a system with your command counter, or command token, cannot move. You also cannot activate a system that you've already activated, or that already has one of your command counters in. So, this lets you lock down a system to prevent anyone from taking it from you. That round. Awesome. Cool. Politics is next. Um, politics has a few different parts to it. The first involves the speaker token. You choose a player other than the speaker, the person that has it, to get the speaker token. If you have the speaker token and you play politics, you got to give it to someone else. But if you don't, you can take it for yourself or give it to someone else. You then draw two action cards off your off the deck here. You got a limit of five of these. If you ever have more, you got to discard down to five. You then get to look at the top two cards of the agenda deck. This deck of cards that I said we would get back to later. You're going to look at the top two, and you're going to choose for each one whether you want to leave it on the top of the deck or put it at the bottom, and you can also choose the order that they go there. That's important for the agenda phase, but we'll get come back to that one. That one is going to be a little bit. The secondary lets you spend a strategy counter to get two action cards. So this is kind of a, a nice little extra engine of getting action cards, because you are going to get some in between rounds as well. Construction. Um, construction is very straightforward. This right here is how you get more of your space docks and your PDS units on the board. So whoever plays it, they get to place a PDS or space dock on a planet you control and then get to place a PDS on a planet you control. So if you have all your space docks out and you don't want to move them, you can place two PDS units. Alternatively, if you have all your space docks out and you do want to move them, you can scuttle one of them and put it somewhere else, as long as it's a planet you control. The secondary lets you spend a sto uh, token from your strategy to place a space dock or a PDS on the planet you control. Very straightforward. Cool. Trade. Now, before I explain trade, I should explain how commodities work. I told you these things here kind of do nothing for you, but um, as soon as you establish borders, as you start expanding, as soon as you establish adjacency, adjacent borders with another player, you can trade if you want to. And how trade works is it's these commodities here. You can say, I'll exchange you, you know, three commodities for three commodities, or 
however much you want to do it, and yeah, you can trade now. Adjacency is also... Now, I'm going to... Okay, before I get into this, I'm going to use a tile from the expansion. I'm going to cover up most of it because it doesn't actually matter, but it just has some symbols that are relevant here. But adjacency can be traced through wormholes. We got three different types of wormholes here. Don't worry about that too much. The main ones you're going to want to see are these alpha and beta wormholes. Some of the tiles have wormholes on them. And they are considered adjacent. So if wormholes end up on opposite sides of the map, you can go from that tile here to that tile over here as, as one movement. You can also trade through wormholes. So they are considered adjacent for the sake of trade as well. Now back to the strategy card. Trade, the first thing it does is it gives whoever does it three trade goods. Awesome, that's three cash. Sweet. You also get get to replenish your commodities. You might have traded already, you know, given these away to someone else, and you might have ended up with some trade goods as a result, and you got no commodities left, or you might have some missing. This lets you replenish all of your commodities. So in the case of Emirates of Akan, you're back up to six. Most factions aren't going to have six. Two, three, maybe four is what you expect. Emirates of Akan are the traders, though, so they have loads. The next part is interesting. You get to choose any number of other players. Those players use the secondary ability of the strategy card without spending a command token. Now, what's the secondary ability? The secondary ability is spend a command token from your strategy to replenish your commodities. So if you're the one that takes trade, you can kind of control other people's replenishment of their commodities a little bit you can let people do it for free well it doesn't even have to be free they can pay you they can bribe you for this kind of thing this is, twilight imperium is a very weird game commodities you can only trade um during the like when you have shared borders but you can make deals that's what these promissory notes are for these are basically things that you can give to other players and say, I will do this thing and give you something in return. So that ability there to let other people at the table replenish their commodities for free, that's something that you can leverage. You know, you can use that as a negotiation tactic however you want, or you can be a nice guy. It's really up to you how you make use of that ability. Um, it's one of the more interesting parts of Twilight Imperium. Now, Emirates of Akan, like I said, every faction has rules that let them kind of break some of the mechanics of the game. And what they got here is you do not have to spend a command token to resolve the secondary ability of the trade strategy card. They're masters of trade. That's one of their abilities here. And, and basically, they ignore that whole rule. So if you're the Emirates of Akan, you don't really care about taking trade that much because you replenish your commodities for free. So unless you want the power of it and the you know extra three trade goods, you know maybe you don't need to take trade. You'll see a lot of that with some of the some of the factions. A lot of overlap with the strategy cards. But. Moving right along to Warfare. Ooh. This is one of the most versatile strategy cards in the game. I've seen this used for expansion. I've seen this used for war. I've seen this used in so many different ways. It is really interesting. The secondary, much less so. We'll explain the secondary first. Spend one token from your strategy pool to use the production ability of one of your space docks in your home system. So... If I had three space docks in my home system, I would only be able to produce in one of them. It doesn't activate the system, though, so those ships can still move. I'm just a lot more limited in um, how many units I can build. Now, the primary. Now, in, in most of these cases, the primary and the secondary had some overlap. In this case, the primary is very different from the secondary. The primary ability lets you remove one command token from the board and put it back in your pools here. You also get to, as a secondary part of it, you also get to redistribute all of your tokens on your board if you want to. Um, so, these ships that I moved here to take control of these planets here, I could use Warfare's primary ability, strip this command token from the board, put it back in my tactics, and now these guys aren't in a system with a command token, which means I can activate another system 
and move them again. Very versatile here. Or I can build again. Or I can... I can... There's tons. There's tons of things you can do here. It's also very threatening. If you've moved a fleet to be next to one of your opponents, they'll look at that and think, okay, I don't have to worry too much about that right now because those ships are stuck. Boom, warfare comes down. You remove the command token. Oh, crud. They can move again. Ah, uh, you know, it lot of lot of versatility in this strategy card. Okay, moving along, keeping things moving. Seven, technology. This is the one that, in my experience, everyone always fights over. Because <laughs> it is one of the most interesting parts of the game. This is how you unlock these cards. These technology cards. This is how you do it. So whoever takes it gets to research a technology. And then they can spend six resources to research another technology. The secondary, you spend a resource, or you spend a token from strategy and four resources to research a technology you might think oh well that's kind of worse well you're getting one for free here so if you get two that's technically uh two for three each whereas this is one for four you know how does research work well remember you start with some technology cards they have these little symbols here these symbols are very important the way research works is a, it's a kind of tiered uh, 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 symbol matching system. So, if we go here, we've got Sarween tools. We got a yellow. So let's look at the yellow technology cards that remain in the base game. We got these ones here. We got Graviton Laser System, we got Transit Diodes, and we've got Integrated Economy. Now, Looking at this one here, looking at Graviton Laser System, you see there's a big yellow symbol there and a little yellow symbol there. That little yellow symbol means you have a prerequisite to research this technology. So if I want this technology, I have to have at least one yellow already, somewhere. I have one. Awesome. I can research it. Moving on. This one needs two yellows. This one needs three yellows. But each one of these also counts as a yellow in and of themselves. Now... I told you that planet card there has a yellow. So when I'm researching technology, I can spend this card for the one resource that it produces, but I'm more likely going to spend this card for the yellow symbol, and that lets me essentially ignore one symbol prerequisite, you know, each time I use this card for research. So this one that uses three, well, I wouldn't need three. I have Sarween tools, I have Lazar, that's two. I only need one more. I could skip Graviton Laser System completely and go right to Transit Diodes and then go to Integrate. There's a lot there. Um, you'll have planets that have technology specialties for each of the four. Um, and they will be hotly contested because being able to jumpstart your research to some of the late stage upgrades can be huge. Um, now... Let's talk about it. let's talk about racial text next. So each uh, each faction is two. Um, some of them could be unit upgrades. Some of them could be just general upgrades. There's a bunch of different variety here. The Emirates of Akan have standard upgrades, and they work the exact same way. They got a yellow symbol there and three yellows. There means if I want this quantum data hub node, I need three yellow symbols. However, I do it. Okay? Now, let's talk about unit upgrades. Unit upgrades are not colored. Unit upgrades also tend to require a combination of symbols to research, whereas these ones here are all a single color. Um, these ones are a bit different. So if I want to upgrade PDS, if I want to upgrade my PDS units, I need a yellow and a red, and then I can take this card, pop it on my board, over top of my standard PDS units. Uh, this is really, really helpful, because what it does is it changes, some of these upgrades will change the stats of your units. And then you don't have to think about what they do once you get the upgrade. You you know, oh, I, I've got that upgrade. This is what my ships do now. Awesome. Sweet. Now, again, they're not 
they don't give you symbols in and of themselves, though. So if you're building these unit upgrades, and there is a ton of them in the base game. One for each ship, for the most part. Um, if you're building these, you're not adding to your collection of symbols to make it easier to research other things. There's a lot of give and take there. Okay. In my experience, this tends to be the most hotly contested strategy card in the game because it is one of the most interesting. Upgrading your units always is. And we've got one more. we got one more. Imperial. Imperial is the weirdest, but probably the most powerful strategy card in the game. Now, before I explain Imperial, let's ex let's talk about Mechatol Rex, the big blown out planet in the center of the galaxy here. When you do your setup, you'll take this token here, and this is the Custodians of Mechatol Rex token, and you're going to pop it on the planet. The first time someone lands infantry on Mechatol Rex, not takes the system, they have to land infantry there. They also have to spend six influence. If they can do that, they take this token, they flip it over, get a permanent victory point for the rest of the game, which is huge, and they control Mechatol Rex. The Imperial... This does two things. The first is that the Imperial strategy card uh, affects who controls Mechatol Rex. This also triggers the agenda phase. This the Mechatol Rex is the seat of the council. So until someone kind of clears out the rubble and rebuilds the rebuilds the the uh, uh, parliament and and gets the guards to stand down, you can't actually hold any. Uh, galactic council so once someone takes that that'll trigger the agenda phase to start happening we'll talk about that one later though it does always happen last of the th of the four phases it's always last so we'll talk about that later but imperial primary ability is all object all about objectives immediately score one public objective if you meet its requirements and Gain one victory point if you control Mechatol Rex. Otherwise, draw a secret objective card. Now, there, there's a lot to unpack there. Public objectives. Let's start there. You have this stack of them. At the start of the game, there's going to be a few revealed. Right? In the status phase, which we'll get to, you can only score one public objective and one secret objective each status phase. So I got two two public objectives here that I can qualify for. I can only score one of them. So you really got to think about when you're going to score which objectives because some of them you might only be able to do because it's oh I need to control these many planets or these specific planets. But then on later turns someone might take them back from me. So you'll want to score that one earlier maybe. And then the ones that are just spend resources or command counters you can plan to do that later. You know. And then secret objectives, you'll have one of them to start with. You can get more. Imperial is a way to do so. But you can only have three. If you ever have more than three, got to get rid of one of them. But that three also includes the ones you've scored. You can score secret objectives. Some of them score in the status phase. Some of them score in the action phase. Make sure you read them so you understand what's going on here. But in the status phase, you can only score one secret objective and one public objective. Um, if you ever have more than three, you gotta get, gotta get rid of them, but you can never have, but this also includes objectives you scored. They stay face up next to you, which means if you already scored three secret objectives, you can't have any more, okay? It limits how much you can, how many points you can get from that. But, Imperial. Imperial is, the strategy cards are played during the action phase. So if you play Imperial, you can score a public objective immediately during the action phase, as long as you meet its requirements. Which means, overall, you can score two public objectives in that round. One in the action phase, one in the status phase, as long as you meet them. The second part of it gets you another secret objective card. Or... If you control Mechatol Rex, you get a victory point. Now, this is massive. This is one of the most straightforward ways of getting victory points, is controlling Mechatol Rex and playing Imperial. 
But that also makes Mechatol Rex the one place that everyone is going to be fighting for, just because of how important of a location it is. Okay? The downside with Imperial is, for the most part, you're going to be going last <laughs> in the action phase. So they balanced it a little bit that way. Okay? Now, let's move on to the status phase. We'll talk about the agenda phase after that, and then we'll get into how combat works. We'll save that one for last, because it does have a bit of quirks unique to it. But let's move on to the status phase. So the status phase, again, popping up my little reference there, has eight parts to it. The first is scoring objectives. In speaker order, again, this is why this is so important. You're going to score objectives. You're going to announce any public objectives you qualify for. You're going to uh, uh, reveal any secret objective cards that you can claim and, and qualify for. And you're going to move up this track based off of how many points you've scored. At any point, if someone hits 10, they win. It's a bit of a race here. It doesn't matter if multiple people can hit 10 in the same turn. The first person to hit 10 wins so controlling the speaker token is important because it lets you score objectives first if 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 one of the players at the table is getting real close and you know they're sitting at seven points and you know they can probably get three points in the status phase and you only need one taking control of that speaker token so that you can score that objective before they do can mean the difference between winning or losing because there is only one winner. It's first to ten. Um, so that's the first part of the status phase. The second part is reveal a new public objective. So, again, you'll have started with two revealed, sitting them somewhere. You're going to flip the next one and reveal it. Read it out, make sure everyone understands what it is. And once all five Phase 1 objective cards are revealed, you move on to the Phase 2. Phase 1 objective cards, if we take a look here, are worth one victory point and are fairly straightforward. Phase 2 objective cards are each worth... Ooh, I'm covering up the spot that has the points. They're each worth two objective cards, and for the most part, require double what Phase 1 needs. So they're, they're tougher to do. But that does mean, overall, if we count it up, we got five possible public objective points, we've got ten possible secret objective points, you got three possible uh, points from control or from uh, claiming se secret objective. Sorry, I five from phase two. Wow, N numbers are hard right now. <laughs> Let me get a drink of water and then I'll try this again. Five potential points from phase one. 10 potential points from Phase 2, 3 potential points from Secret Objectives. The first person to claim Mechatol Rex gets a point. And then each turn after that, whoever has Mechatol Rex can, can, but won't always, get a point from the Imperial Strategy card. So there's a lot of ways of getting points. And you only need 10. Uh, so what's that? Baseline, you've got 15, 18, 19, plus whatever you get from Mechatol Rex. You only need 10 points. But everyone is going to be hunting for them. They are they're, uh, public. Everyone knows what everyone is trying to do, and you can stop them. There are ways to do that. You know, if there's things that are, like, controlling planets, well, maybe you take them from them. It, because you're, you're, you're claiming objectives in the status phase, after the action phase. And that is why when you pass is so important, because if you think someone's going to attack you, you'll want to delay a little bit until you can wait to pass after they do. Or, um... Because you can be nice neighbors. You can... You can de-escalate your borders and play nice because you don't need any territory that they've got and and them being there is being a nice buffer between you and someone else but maybe they have one territory you need for the final two points to win you the game and you decide in the last round of the game that you're going to just break that a, a, a non non-binding but still very effective agreement and attack them at in the final round after they've already passed and can't do anything about it to take the territory you need to finish the objective to win the game. Sorry, Ambrose. <laughs> uh, that's why that's so important. 
But, moving on. Um, so you're scoring objective cards is first, revealing objectives is next, drawing action cards. Everyone gets two. Unless your uh, rules state otherwise. Again, hand limit of five. Um, so you'll have to discard down immediately after. <sighs> Let's talk about action cards. There is a massive, massive, massive stack. Again, I have the expansion, so there's a few extras. Don't worry about it. There's tons of them. There are two that everyone needs to know. Everyone needs to know about these two. And they are Sabotage and Direct Hit. Now I'm going to read out the two of them, and then we'll explain what they mean. Sabotage. When another player plays an action card other than Sabotage, cancel that action card. And then Direct Hit says, After another player's ship uses sustained damage to cancel a hit produced by one of your units, destroy that ship. Now, Sabotage... That is pretty straightforward. Someone plays an action card, you cancel it. You used to be able to sabotage sabotages in 3rd edition. They got rid of that in 4th edition because it made for some very crazy um, things. Because, oh, sorry, pardon me. Because someone could play a direct hit, right? And sabotage says whenever another player plays an, an action card, you can cancel it. So then... The person they're fighting might sabotage the direct, hit, the direct hit. And then someone else at the table might look at that fight going on and say, no, 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 I want that direct hit to go through and sabotage their sabotage. And it just these massive chains. You can't do that anymore. You cannot sabotage sabotage cards. But direct hits are still very threatening. And sabotages are very important because you got to know your action cards are never guaranteed. If someone doesn't like what you're doing, they can just cancel it. Or if you if you piss them off, they could just do it just to spite you. That is a thing. Um, now, direct hits. Sustain damage. Direct. And whenever a unit uses sustain damage from a, a hit that you've produced, you can destroy that ship. Now, what is sustain damage? Well, in some of the bigger ships, specifically these three, um, Dreadnoughts, War Sons, and your flagships in combat these ships are very tough you'll you can assign a hit to them but it doesn't immediately destroy them they use what is called sustained damage you take the unit and you flip it upside down to show that it has sustained damage it's still fighting at full capacity but it's not destroyed yet a direct hit lets you wipe it out because they could have used that trying to be safe to protect some of their other ships, and now you've just taken out one of their most dangerous ships in their fleet with an action card. So I highlight these two because it's very important that people understand they exist, so that you can kind of plan around them. There's nothing worse than thinking you've got the, a fight in the bag and... Uh, a, a fighter gets a lucky shot and you assign it to your war son, the most expensive ship in the game, and then it gets taken out by a piddly fighter that's worth a half a resource and war sons are worth 12. It sucks. <laughs> and it's happened to me. So just be aware that it exists. All right. <laughs> um, now... So the, the, the fourth part of the status phase is removing command counters. You take all of the command counters that you put down on the board, you take them off the board. You don't get them back, but you take them off the board. You then gain new ones. You get two of them. So you start with three here. You start with two here. You start with three here. These aren't spent. We'll get to what these are in a second. But these aren't spent. These will just stay here. You might have, let's say you did two tactical actions and a strategic action. Well, you're only going to get two of those three back. You're not going to get all of them back. And when you get them back, you don't have to put them back where you got them from. You could, you could load up on strategic actions if there's a bunch of strategy cards that you want to get involved in. Or you could load up on tactical actions if, there's, if you've got a lot of fighting or you want to do a lot of production or whatever the case may be. But you only get two back. Leadership... This guy here is used to get more, and there are other ways of getting more, but keep in mind that your kind of ability to do more stuff later in the game is going to be slowed down unless you plan for it, okay? 
Um, what's next? Ready cards. All right. All of those planets that you've taken during the round, any planets that you've spent for their resource value or their influence or their technology specialties, at this point you can ready them. Flip them back over. They are now ready to go again for use whenever. Now, important to note, if you take a planet from another player, you take that card from them but it comes to you flipped over. Even if it was ready to go, you always receive the planets exhausted. Keep that in mind. Uh, repair units. So any units we just talked about sustain damage, any units that used sustain damage in the previous round repair themselves, which is important because it means that you, you don't get to use sustain damage once a fight. It's once a round per ship. So if you get involved in multiple fights and a ship is already damaged, it stays damaged until you have time to repair it. And then you return the strategy cards to whoever is now the speaker token, and you go again. Unless, unless the agenda phase has been readied. Now, the agenda phase, like I said, doesn't happen at the start of the game. Your first couple rounds, you're not probably going to do the agenda phase until someone takes Megatol Rex, and then you will. And the agenda phase is exactly what I said. It is the politics side of Twilight Imperium. Because you're not just military leaders. You're cultural leaders. You're political leaders. And you're meant to be equal members of this galactic society here. And the agenda phase is where you as a group will vote on laws and directives that are active for the rest of the game in some cases. So let's talk about how that works. Agenda phase is always after the status phase. And it is it goes in three parts. You will draw. In, the speaker will draw and resolve the first agenda off the deck. You will then draw and resolve the second agenda off the deck. And then you'll ready your planets again. Now why is, why is that important? Well, let's look at what one of these cards are to start with. So, we've got Archived Secret. It is a directive. What a directive means is it's an effect that triggers immediately. It's not a remains in play effect, it just happens as soon as it's resolved. And this says Elect Player. Elected Player draws one secret objective. Now, with directives, you'll see things Elect Player, Elect System, Elect Planets. How This is how that works. In Speaker Order, Always in speaker order, each person is going to elect uh, uh, their choice. You can elect any planet, or in this case, any player. Elected player draws a secret objective. I can choose anyone at the table. I can choose myself. I can choose someone else. You always have a minimum of one vote. But if you want more votes, you can spend influence, the blue number on your planets here, for extra votes. So if I really wanted to, I have all these planets here. I don't have a lot of influence. I got one, two, three. So I could spend those three for three votes and say, I want that. But let's, at this point of the game, someone would have Mechatol Rex. Mechatol Rex is worth six influence. So they could just spend just Mechatol Rex and say, no, 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 I'm electing myself. Or they could elect someone else. Now, it's important to note, in this case, these planets each only have one. But if you have a planet like Megatol Rex that has six, all of that influence has to get spent when you use it. Now, you have a few choices in these, uh, uh, in these votes. You can choose to elect a player, or you can abstain. Abstaining means you are stepping back. You're stepping back from the vote. You're not getting involved. You're not spending anything, but you're also gaining no... Uh, uh, sway in um, no direct sway in this vote. However, that doesn't stop you from making deals. Now, the agenda phase is another way that you can make deals. You can trade uh, trade goods and not action cards, though. Keep that in mind. Trade goods and promissory notes freely in the agenda phase to broker deals to try and get one or multiple people to vote a way you want. So even if you might abstain, you could still have the vote go the way you want if you've brokered enough support with some of these other factions, right? So let's talk about 
these promissory notes. I have one extra because I have the expansion, so don't worry about this one. It's the Alliance card, but you're going to have five. Four that are generic and one that is unique to your faction. Okay? It's got a little symbol for your faction on the bottom there. The ones that are unique to your faction usually interact with your faction's abilities in some way. Usually, um, well, let's talk about this one. Action. So as an action in the action phase, play this card face up in your play area. While this card is in your play area, you may negotiate transactions with players who are not your neighbor. If you activate a system that contains one or more units of the Hakan player's units, return this card to that player. That is an ability that the Hakan, the Emirates of Hakan get. They have guild ships. You can negotiate transactions with players who you are who are not your neighbor. So if I give this to you as your action, you can play that in the action phase and you have that ability as well until you activate a system that contains one of my ships we've got trade agreements here um when the yellow player refreshes commodities the yellow player gives you all his commodities then return this card so when trade happens and and i mean that's huge for the emirates of a Khan or for someone else because they're gonna get six commodities and then you can play this card and take all of those six commodities and get them as trade goods but then you give this card back to them. You got Political Secret. When an agenda is revealed, the yellow player cannot vote, play action cards, or use faction abilities until after that agenda has been resolved. Then return this card to the player. We got Ceasefire. After the yellow player activates a system that contains one or more of your units, the yellow player cannot move units into the activated system. Then return this card to that player. And we got Support for the Throne. When you receive this card, if you are not the yellow player, you must play it face up in your play area and gain a victory point. If you if you activate a system that contains one or more of the yellow player's units, or if the yellow player is eliminated, lose one victory point and return this card to the yellow player. Yes, you can get wiped out. If, if you ha control no planets on the board, you're eliminated. You have, if you have no means of producing ships, you control no planets, you're wiped out. I've only ever seen it happen once, and it was to me. <laughs> so... In all the years I've been playing this game, it does not happen very often. Now, the important thing to note about promissory notes. Just because you gave one to me, doesn't stop me from trading it to someone else. <laughs> so you can have really funny stuff about two players agreeing for a ceasefire, trading ceasefire cards, and agreeing not to fight each other, and then one, one person looking at the other one and saying, If you trade that to that guy, I will kill you. <laughs> it can happen. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's part of the game. Now, deals. Like I said, you can broker deals however you please in the agenda phase. You resolve an agenda. Players spend any influence they want to spend for votes they want. You resolve the aftermath of it. But then the speaker draws a second one, and you resolve it. And this is where abstaining is interesting, because these planets that I've spent, let's say I spent these three planets for three votes in that, that first agenda because I really wanted that secret objective. I know I only have the one vote I get to start with because I got no influence left for the second agenda. And this agenda is the minister of or yeah, the minister of policy. This is a law. This is the other type of agenda cards. So you elect a player. The elected player gains this card. At the end of the status phase, the owner of this card draws one action card. This is a law. Laws remain in play for the rest of the game unless some effect allows you to repeal them. But in general, uh, half of these agenda cards are laws, and these you're going to be voting on, and these are going to apply for the entirety of the game, and some of them are incredibly game-changing. This one here is largely minor, but having extra action cards can be a big deal. Those are really powerful effects. And I've spent all my influence... So I, I don't have any way of, of... I don't have any chance of getting that myself. And so someone who chose to abstain in the first agenda, uh, you know, now they can load up their uh, their votes on this second one and, and be ready to go. But how would they know? Well, remember the political card? Let's you 
look at the top two and choose to put either of them on the bottom or top and reorder them however you choose, they could have planned it. They could think, oh, someone's going to want this one. I really want this one. I'm going to put that second. Let everyone spend all their influence on the first one, and then I can just walk away with the second one. Or they can be, oh, I don't want either of those. Bottom of the deck. <laughs> I don't want to see them. And just get rid of them entirely. So it's... it's uh, the politics card isn't incredibly powerful until the agenda phase is triggered, but then after that it gets so much more interesting because it gives you so much more control over the flow of, of you know, of the agenda phase and potentially control over the mechanics of the game as some of these laws can be very punishing to certain factions. However, regardless of how the two cards had been resolved, at the end of the agenda phase, you're also going to refresh your planet cards once again, so that in the action phase, they are ready to go. Which means there is no harm in using any and all of the influence you've got on votes. Because you're going to get the planets back. Now, one important thing to note. Trade goods can be spent for influence or resources, but they cannot be spent for extra votes. I've got six trade goods here. I can't spend them for six votes. It's not how it works. Okay? Cool. Now, we're going to talk about combat, and we're going to talk about special systems. Uh, let's talk about special systems first. Hazardous systems. Uh, I will need to find a few. Most of the systems that we've been dealing with are standard systems. You've got home systems, you've got Mechatol Rex, you have other systems with planets in them. Hazardous systems, as I'm ruffling through some of my components here, hazardous systems have red borders. So there's one, there's another, there's another, there's another. Those are, I believe, the four main types. We've got asteroid fields, nebulas, we've got supernovas, and gravity rifts. These could show up, or they might not. It all kind of depends on how you build the map and uh, what you choose to, you know, build it out of. So let's explain these, and then we'll get into combat. Each one of these systems offers a wrinkle. They are summarized on the bottom here. Now, overall, just because there's a hazardous sector doesn't mean you can't potentially make use of it, but there are certain ones that, that are problematic. Uh, let's talk about asteroid fields first. Asteroid fields are very straightforward. Uh, you can't move through it or into it. Full stop. Unless, and you're going to hear that a lot with with people explaining the mechanics of this game. I have anti-mass deflectors. I've never explained what anti-mass deflectors does. Anti-mass deflectors says your ships can move into and through asteroid fields. So if I have anti-mass deflectors, I can move into that asteroid field. It's considered a safe space for me because I can just do that now. My ships have have you know anti-kinetic shields that. Um, or kinetic barriers, whatever it is, <laughs> that lets me be protected from all that space debris. Meaning that if my opponent doesn't have any mass deflectors, I can get in there, and that is a, potentially a launching point for me. There's no, uh, there's no planets there, but you know it's territory. Territory is territory. Any mass deflectors also says whenever one, uh, whenever other players use the space cannon uh, ability against your unit, supply minus one to the results of the roll. We'll get to that later. We'll get to that with combat. But these are essentially just a wall. Easy peasy. Nebulas. Big gas clouds in space. Ships cannot move through nebulas, but you can move into a nebula. What do I mean? Well, we got a nebula here. Mechatel Rex is here. My planet is here. I got a ship in here. That's not a good example. I got a cruiser in here. Cruiser has a movement of two. I want to get to Mechatel Rex. I cannot move through the nebula. I can move into. So for one activation, I would activate the nebula, move my ship in. 
And then next turn, I can remove that command counter. Now I can activate Mechatol Rex and move my ship out. They're, they're tough to move through. They, they very much slow you down. But ships in Nebula moving out also only have a movement of one. So my cruiser, which had a movement of two, leaving the Nebula only has a movement of one. However, as the defender in combat, you get a bit of you get a bit of a combat bonus fighting in the nebula. You get to apply a plus one to all combat dice rolls while as a defender in the nebula. Again, we'll get to that with combat. <laughs> Supernova <laughs> can't move through it. Can't move into it unless again. There is a faction that exists, uh, the Embers of Muat, who are uh, living suns, essentially. They can exist in a nebula. It's fine. They don't care. They're good. But for everyone else, that is a solid wall you cannot get through. There is no tech to let you get through that. Okay? Gravity Rifts. Gravity Rifts are weird. Um... You can move into a gravity rift. No problem. Cool. I can move in. Boom. I'm in there. Getting out is a bit more complicated. You can also move through gravity rifts. So if I was here. Cool. I can activate here. I can go through. But I pass through the gravity rift. And, and whether you're starting in the gravity rift and moving out or you're moving through it, you have to roll a die. One of these... Ten-sided dice that come with the game. Huh. All right. Well, sorry about that. My camera died while I was halfway through recording Gravity Refs. So I'm going to have to start that again, I guess. Um, so I said you can move through Gravity Refs and you can move into and out of Gravity Refs. Gravity Refs do two things. The first is that a ship moving through or out of a gravity rift actually gets plus one movement. So if we just threw another tile here for this example, this cruiser has a movement of two. It could actually get here if it moves one, two, plus one for the gravity rift. However, every ship moving through or out of a gravity rift has to roll one of the ten-sided dice. On a roll of one to three, the ship blows up. I got a four. I'm good. But you have to roll for every single ship. So they're very potentially good, but also very dangerous. Now, let's talk about combat. Combat has two main types. You've got space combat and you've got invasion combat. Now, both aspects of combat work largely the same. Let me clear this stuff off of the sheet again. So, if we have a look at your board here, the numbers that are relevant for combat is this combat value. So for carriers it's a 3, for dreadnoughts it's a 5. And how that works is when you're in combat, when that ship is shooting, you roll the 10-sided die, and you need to get equal to or above to hit. So that means a 10 is always a hit, or a, the, the zero result is always a hit, whereas a 1, as far as things go, is always a miss. You roll for every ship in combat and deal damage as a result. So the lower this number is, the better. I've also already explained sustained damage. That is used in combat as well. So let's break down space combat first. So let's say we had we had a fight. We have a Dreadnought here. We've got a, a Destroyer here on the red side. The yellow side has a couple fighters. You know, they might have a carrier. And let's say it's actually... A system the yellow player can, or the red player rather controls because that gets into a couple of quirks there was one thing that I mentioned before but I haven't actually explained yet 
and I'm having a hard time finding a PDS for red because I've got this big bag of part. Hold on. <laughs> Problem with little bags for everything is it makes it hard to find some of the small individual pieces. So let's say I have a PDS unit on this planet, and my fleet for yellow is a cruiser, a carrier, two fighters, uh, and let's say yellow activates the system. When the ships move in, as after movement is done, the ships have moved in. Planetary, oh, sorry, not planetary shield, space cannon triggers. And what space cannon is, it's an ability that the PDS units have. And in this case, at baseline, it says space cannon six. So ships moving into a system that contain PDS units, the PDS essentially get to fire at them. So you roll a die for each of your PDS units. You're trying to get like combat equal to or above the value of the result. So it says space cannon six. I got a nine here. That's good. That would take out one of the ships. But let's say this wasn't there. Um, the first part of space combat is anti-fighter barrage. So let's array out my ships here. Anti-fighter barrage is only triggered in the first round of combat. So only initially. You get to use it once. and But you get to use it for all of your ships that have anti-fighter barrage. And what anti-fighter barrage is for is for getting rid of these pesky little fighters that can soak up hits. Because of how cheap they are. So destroyers have anti-fighter barrage. And so it says on the sheet, anti-fighter barrage, 9 times 2. So for each destroyer, you roll two dice. And you're looking for a 9 or better. Oh, I got a 9. That would take out one of the fighters. But continuing on. That is always done initially, but it's only ever at the first round of combat. Now, the second stage of space combat is announcing retreats. So yellow's moved in. Red might have some territory back here. They can announce they want to try and retreat. They don't want to take the fight. So they announce their retreat. Um, yellow could also decide, oh, maybe the space, com the space cannon attacks from the PDS or the anti-fighter barrage didn't go their way and I uh, don't really want to fight that anymore. They could announce a retreat if they wanted to as well. Retreats aren't resolved right away, though. you got to survive that round of combat to be able to retreat. But you can only retreat into what is a friendly zone. So something that you already control. Um, and by retreating, you also would activate that system, again, locking the ships down. But once announcing retreats is done, you make combat rolls. You do this kind of one by one. The game does give a nice amount of these ten-sided dice. So you shouldn't need too much more than that. Um, but let's break it down ship by ship. So I got a carrier that shoots on nine. I got two fighters that shoot on nine. And I got a cruiser that shoots on seven. So let's say I do the cruiser first as yellow. Oh, that's a seven. That's a hit. Um... And then we'll do the carrier on nine and the fighters on nine. They all hit on nine and there's no other special abilities there. So I can roll them all at once. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So I got one hit. Now red has to assign the hit. But if, if they, for instance, assign the hit to the destroyer, that does destroy the ship. But the ship gets to return fire still. So but given that it's a dreadnought, let's say they use sustained damage. That assigns the hit. Now both of their ships get to shoot back. They got a destroyer that shoots on nine. That's a seven. That misses. They got a dreadnought that shoots on five. That's a one. That misses. Now, if red retreated, they would get to, again, they would activate the adjacent system with from their, from their um, reinforcements, essentially from their supply. So it doesn't cost them anything on their pools, and they pull all their ships back. Um, if they didn't retreat, if they didn't announce retreats, you keep going until someone doesn't have ships left. After that, whoever is remaining controls the space, but not necessarily the planet. I'm uh, going to take a brief aside here to explain two things that I forgot to mention while explaining combat. The first is regarding certain ships that actually shoot multiple times. We see the picture here of the War Sun technology card. You can see... 
on the uh, combat value there, there's a number of pips. What those pips mean is when you shoot with one war sun, you roll three dice and can assign potentially three hits for that one ship. Um, some flagships shoot multiple times as well, but it's predominantly just these two types of ships that have that. The other thing that I meant to mention before, but was going to bring it up with space combat, I'm going to bring up an image of your command counter pools here again. Now, fleet supply. The way fleet supply works is the number of tokens you have in your fleet supply determines the maximum potential size of your fleet in capital ships. I mentioned this before, fighters don't count as capital ships, so they don't count against your fleet supply here. But in the image here, we've got three tokens in fleet supply. That means my fleet supply is three. That means I cannot have a force that is greater than three at the end of movement and combat resolution. So what that means is I can overload a system bring four, five, six ships into a system. If I really, really want to win a certain combat and think I'm going to take some casualties on, but at the end of combat, if I did win, I have to scuttle units down to my fleet supply. This applies across the board. Every individual hex. I can never have more than three ships. If I want to have bigger fleets, uh, when I gain command counters, I need to choose, instead of putting them in tactics or strategy, to add them to my fleet supply. And in between rounds, or after resolving the warfare primary strategy card ability, I can redistribute my tokens, taking some into or out of fleet supply as the need arises. Now, continuing on this example, let's say that Yellow actually also had, they got two fighters there. Let's say the carrier had four ground forces here as well. Okay, along with. No, no, that wouldn't work. That's four capacity. So two ground forces, good enough. Um, and continuing the example, let's say Red has a PDS unit there and a ground force on each planet. Um... The way invasion combat works is it first starts with bombardment. You you um, have you look at any ships that you got that have the bombardment ability. Dreadnoughts are the main ones. War suns do as well, um, and some flagships, but not all, have bombardment. Uh, dreadnoughts, for instance, it says bombardment five, and that works the same way. You pick a planet. And for each of your ships that have bombardment to choose to bombard, so let's say I'm going to bombard this planet. I roll, and if I get a five or better, that wipes out an infantry unit. I didn't get that. This planet has a PDS system. PDS has an ability called Planetary Shield, which negates, or which prevents the use of bombardment. Unless, and we talked about this before, War Suns have a special ability that negates planetary shield. So if you have a War Sun in that army, none of the PDS units in that system can use their planetary shield. Um, so that would be the first part of invasion combat. The next part is committing ground forces. So I might say, okay, I'll go one here, one here. Or if I'm... <sighs> See, there's a PDS unit there, so maybe I might accept not taking this planet right away, attack it again later, and commit both my ground forces here. Um, because the next phase is space cannon defense. So we had space cannon offense, which is when ships move into a system with a, a, a PDS unit. But then you have space cannon defense. And what that is, is as the units are hot dropping in to land on the planets, any PDS on that planet can actually fire at them. And it works the exact same way. You roll, and if you get equal to or better your space cannon result, you wipe out one of the infantry. If you fail, then they stay. And then you move on to ground combat. And ground combat works the exact same way as... Um, as space combat, except you can't retreat. So infantry have a combat of eight baseline. So red has one infantry, yellow has two infantry, that's that's two hits, that's fine, takes out the infantry. Any structures on the planet, whether they're PDS units or space docks, get wiped out 
sent back to the red unit supply. You take control of the planet, you take the card from them, but you take the card exhausted. Now, there is... Now, so I've won this invasion, I have ships in the system, but I don't control the entire system because Red still controls that planet. They still keep that card. As long as they t maintain control of that planet, you know, they still have it. Now there's a quirk. There's another, there's another quirk. Space docks. So, uh, uh, buildings only get destroyed when you take the planet in invasion combat, right? But the space dock is still there. So what that means is that building is blockaded. So the space dock cannot produce any ships while you control the space, but it can still produce ground forces. Okay. Um, da, da, da. Is there anything else? Yes. Space cannon. So the upgraded... PDS unit allows you to use your space cannon ability in adjacent systems. If, for instance, you have a you have a PDS unit in this system and someone else activates this system, as part of that movement, you can shoot at them. Even if you're not going to be involved in whatever combat they, there may be, that is still close enough for you to shoot. It's all done as a result of movement. So when they're done moving their ships in, you can shoot at the ships that are in and their movement in an adjacent system and this is done at the same time as regular space cannon offense before combat meaning if someone's moving into control mechatol rex and you don't like that or you know you don't want you don't want them to take it because they're a bit a uh, big force or you maybe want to soften them up for the other person so that you can sweep in later you can actually take some pot shots at them from a system away do damage to them and thing to consider you got carriers right you need infantry to take control of planets but if you lose all your ships you lose all your carriers everything on that gets destroyed too now the person taking the damage gets to assign hits and that's where sustained damage is so useful and everything else but if they've only got the one carrier and a couple of ground forces and it's a hail mary shot one shot from a system away could uh, kibosh their whole strategy in in an instant. I've seen it happen, and it's amazing. <laughs> um, do we need to think about anything else? No, that's basically it. Um, keep in mind action cards. Some action cards are only usable in combat. Uh, keep in mind ship upgrades. It's going to be up to you to remember what you've got. That's why the nice thing they've got here is the ship upgrade or the unit upgrades are cards so that you can see everything here. But keep in mind the tech that you've researched as well, because some of them will help you in combat. Um, and that's basically it. We've talked about the, the four main phases of the game. We've talked about the three types of actions. We've talked about objectives. We've talked about combat and we've talked about all the different things as far as systems and components goes. You should be good. And that was Twilight Imperium. It is a huge game. The length of this video probably shows that pretty clearly, but it is worth it. It is such a interesting game, such an intricate game. There's so much going on. There is a lot to remember, so do not be afraid to be digging through this rules reference if you need to. Learn how it's set up because you will be digging through this. You'll see even in this video I pull this every now and then just to remind myself on the exact you know terminology and specifics of it. Get used to that. It'll take a little bit to get the handle on the game and even once you've got it, like, I don't play this game nearly often enough to have every individual rule and edge case memorized, and you won't either. That is fine. Just make sure your players understand there's going to be some bumps in the road as you go. But, hopefully, you're comfortable enough to be able to play this game, and you've set aside enough time. I plan for a weekend. We, I get things set up somewhere Friday night. We might start playing Friday night. 
will play for most of Saturday, and then if it needs a little bit of extra time to finish, we'll finish it Sunday morning. Now, this is us taking breaks for meals and, um, you know, side activities, because this is a very heavy game. It will wear you out. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but it will. Anyway. This was Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next time.